microphone. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> Give me a second. I love how every week it's like, and here we are, bitch. Well, I also did What's nails. To be revealed? So like <laughs> So did I. So did I. Also, I did I did them last night because I was like, that'll I have a list. I was like, I did them last night because that will save me time in the morning. Could not function doing the makeup and like putting in contact. So I had to take them off and redo them. <laughs> Well, I'll have you know that mine have already come off like five times. So no, <laughs> you gotta get that Dollar Tree thing. nail glue, baby. They baby. know it's. Uh, I know. I I got it. Oh god. Are we gonna reveal? I guess we reveal. Okay, you want to do the countdown? <laughs> <laughs> Three, two, one. <sighs> oh I my knew, god! I knew Wait. I sent spirit. <laughs> Not Teresa Caputo. <laughs> Wait, stop. Are you like interview with the vampire? Yeah. Oh, Claudia. my God. <laughs> Wait, I love your costume so much. Show I me those duck nails. I Show love me those nails. So much. When I talk with these, I feel just like instantly more in control. You are. No, because you are. <laughs> That's what a duck nail does. That's what they're called, right? Duck nails? The duck nails. The duck nails, honey. Oh my god! Where's okay, the I'm from? actually like, like I have like tears in my eyes again, but this time just because this is like, I'm this is so good. <laughs> Look at the contour. Also, the, I got do clocks. You have contacts. So- <laughs> That's gonna be on par with. Are you wearing foundation? By the way, I have That's my gonna camera be on like par. this big right now because I've got my research. <laughs> I was like, do you have contacts? I'm like, none. Those- Oh my god. <laughs> Baby, that is elevated. Yeah, you think so? That is elevated. This is what I was waiting on last night, this goddamn ruffle shirt. Because I was like, <laughs> yeah, it really so ties it all waited. together. But Oh my god. I got Especially clocked. with the pink mic. Exactly. I was like, it's really important <laughs> to me that everything is kind of historically accurate. I need to know that like, I'm going into it with a good foot. Of course. But I got clocked so hard last time because of my hard front wig. Twice! Two Stop. hard front wigs. That I was like, I have to do so something different. So you went with different. lice? I went with lice, baby. She's well, lice. It looks really freaking high quality. <laughs> mine. Claudia. <laughs> my, mine might be a hard front. Yours is. Wait, I need to see more of what's going on. Did you tease it or is it literally like that? It's like this. Um, <laughs> and I've got the duck nails. I've got. The duck nails, I got to say, they change yeah, that, I mean, that's what that's what sells it. And then the sky top. Yes, I was going to yeah. say, I was like, it's, it's that V cut. It's, it's that, that chunky that gold neck. necklace. What I'm was the makeup research the or what was the dramaturg um, research on the makeup? I want to know everything. Just tanned, did some bottom mm-hmm. lash mascara, lots of eyeliner. Could you do um, it? I need impressions, please. <laughs> All I've been saying to myself is someone <laughs> stepping forward with a J name. I'm feeling <laughs> no. a restriction on the throat. He did pass over into the. Before he left the physical world. Before he left the physical, <laughs> the physical world. Yes. <laughs> but I need more. Who you connect to a father? Does anybody here have a father in the room? Anybody? Someone. Someone. Okay, I'm getting. A, I'm getting a J name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it a Jason or like a John? John. I knew. I, I thought it was a Johnny because he was saying, "Hello, I'm Big Johnny." Saying- when I walk into a room, <laughs> 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 that's literally it. Who's the mother? No, I who, lost a who thing in here already. Had a- no. <laughs> who in here had the mother figure? The mother figure. Oh, my God. <sighs> Hold on. <laughs> First of all, when I was like, I need more time, I was boiling water to, yeah. like, heat up the wax to pop these babies in. Let's oh see if I can do it God. again. Maybe I'll just take them out. They've already got the screenshot. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'll just go with one. Thing, I'll take I'm going to go with one. one. <laughs> oh, my God. I forget. What's the character's name in Interview with the Vampire? Louie. L- Louis. Louis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Louis. Is that the name of Teresa's husband or is that like Frank? Um, I don't know who th- that is someone in Teresa's world, but I don't know who that is in Teresa's world. Yeah. There is a Louis, but it's not. There's definitely there's definitely an L name. There's an okay. Who who was the man with the L name? Okay, <laughs> please know that he is stepping forward. Do you recognize that? Please, please no, acknowledge that that he is stepping forward right now between us. Do you understand that? Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm now what is the symbol for doves? I'm getting I'm seeing lots of doves. What is that about? <laughs> What is that about? What is that about? It's always the restriction on the throat or 
um, I'm feeling a sharp pain in the back, in the lower back. How does that, and that how does is my that symbol with you? for where <laughs> that I got my back blown out. That is my symbol yeah. for that. Yeah. Oh my God, baby. <laughs> this one. And we're back. I'm going to be so sad when we aren't doing these anymore. Like, how do we incorporate this into Thanksgiving? And <laughs> <laughs> if we can both show up dressed as turkeys, like cooked turkeys, say no more. You're like, I got I'm getting I'm getting something from beyond from the <laughs> yeah. spirit world. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you acknowledge that? Do you acknowledge it? Do you it? understand Thank what you. I mean when I say that? Didn't she get divorced from her husband? I think so, yeah. Didn't see that and, coming. Uh I believe her daughter is like a makeup artist now or something. Yeah. I was doing a little backstory. I got re interested in Teresa Caputo. <laughs> She's on tour right now. I saw it on TikTok. Well getting tickets. I was going to say, I'll see you out there, Teresa. But those are like giant like group readings, though. Oh, my God. If you showed up like this to one of her readings, you would definitely get called. And she'd go, oh, my God. I can't even believe what I'm seeing right now. I, I'm sensing hackery in the room. How does she – how do you think she navigates like going about her life in the world? Because she is – I mean, you could say it and argue like, oh, she's like C-list famous or like D-list famous. But she's yeah. like instantly recognizable. Like, yeah, maybe not everybody would know her. But even if you don't, you're going to notice her in a room and be like – that's somebody. 1,000%. I was actually thinking about that when I was looking at reference photos of her, that one, I wondered the origin of the hair. Like, I wondered how long <laughs> Was it always it like this? Yeah. yeah. How long had it been like that? And then I noticed there was an era where she started adding extensions. And I was just like, it's so just incredible. So it was incredible like just this that- teased up hair <laughs> and then like really long. But then long blonde extensions. Nice. She's literally never changed it. And that's how you become iconic. <laughs> that's iconic. That's, that's how iconic. you become a Halloween I'm costume. I'm a Halloween costume, honey. To reach oh, what she was doing God. from the get-go. Is she on, is it TLC or She's Lifetime? She's on TLC, baby. She's on Long TLC. Long Island Medium. I think it was TLC. Long Island Medium. Well. Long Island Medium. So we have two people from the spirit world here. We have Teresa Caputo <laughs> and we have Lowy. We have Lowy. 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 <laughs> now I want to be Teresa Judy J for the next one. <laughs> you can be Lowy. I, I won't is- say which, but I was close to being a housewife this time around. I was Stop. very close, and I will not say which. I I was trying to manifest that because <laughs> I had the exact same thought. I think I had the exact same thought that you had. <laughs> if we, that's my dream is that we'll show up as the same exact thing. That's what, like one that's of the weeks, and then we're gonna be like, when you first came on, I'll be honest, I thought you were Miss Grace. Stop. Okay. Momentary. Well, I thought I was like, I can reuse this for an antsy wig. Oh, no. That, that wig is going to, first of all, this can be used. I don't know for what generic leading lady girl, yeah. but like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad wig. It's I, a little long. And we now have these like arsenal of like costumes to play with for the, for the rest of our days. If you think I'm keeping this ruffle shirt, you are correct. <laughs> it was, I, honestly, it was so funny because when you texted me last night and you were like, it needs to look period. I was like, what could this be? But you and thought then, I meant like period. Like no, not like no, no, period. historical period. No, I thought historical period and I thought, oh my God, is he gonna be like somebody from the crown or like Queen Elizabeth? But there's something because I had that thought too. I was like, I kinda wanna be like Queen Elizabeth. Oh my god. I didn't even think about that, like doing an actual like historical person. I, I initially I did a test run of the makeup trying to look like Brad Pitt and I tried to get close, but I like last night I did like a whole like nose sculpt thing and I was like I'm gonna look like Brad Pitt in the movie. <laughs> I got as close as I could. It looks so good. I just love don't you feel like you have to talk like this with the nails? I the nails really first last night, because I watched two scary movies last night, all night I was just like All scratch, I wanna do scratch, is just describe and touch and I I'm Are you finding it difficult to like maneuver things? Yeah, and like deal with like m- like maneuvering things like on the computer, or, like yeah. dealing with your phone. I know that's gonna happen. I'm gonna be like. <laughs> I also um <laughs> I poured myself a hot cup of chai tea this morning. <gasps> However, these fangs, the wax is heat activated, so I'm gonna lose the other ones. <laughs> <if> <laughs> I drink it. <laughs> Just have teeth falling out. Just like, melting, right? Just the hot on. wax flavor into the tea, steeped with hot wax. It feels nice to have eyebrows this week. It really does, I got to say. Yeah, you look so like contoured too, which I love. You I had snatched. to do something. I had to do something by Beatlock. My snatched. last two costumes 
where <laughs> Bette Midler is Winifred Sanders said in Long Legs. I was like, <laughs> I, I think it's time to like reactivate a, a little bit of sex appeal here. So I know. Here we are. And same here. <laughs> oh, well, you're baby. nothing but you're walking sex. Walking sex. Oh, that was the one thing that I kind of <laughs> wish I had more of was like a big. Good. It's gone. <laughs> oh, and goodbye. And just like that, it's over. And just like that. I wish I had. Um, like a push-up bra on and i didn't have one that, that was the oh. last kind of component that i was missing but does she have big boobs she kind of does and i think it's just accentuated <laughs> by not the whisper <laughs> she kind of does did you expect it? i was zooming it did you expect it did you expect it did you expect it did you expect it oh my god i never noticed that oh. Teresa and her her jugs i know well Good baby i have brought to you today it's weird because the case i'm bringing is from Portland, Oregon, which the weather outside, it was like super sunny and it looks sunny behind me, but it just changed to like kind of foggy overcast and oh. reminds me so much like oddly of it, it makes sense with the story. So I'm like feeling the spook. Really? Feeling, it's it's yeah. overcast here as well, I will say, but I think that's because we're up super early. We're usually recording in the afternoon, but it's really kind of like moody out right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. Have you ever heard of the Martin family disappearance? It's a case from the 1950s. No, 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 no. Okay. Oh, Never. Well, I'm excited because then we can kind of like, really, this will be your first time hearing it. And I don't think we've covered a case from the 50s in a long time, like an older case. The only thing that comes to mind is the Sodder children, which we did, I think, either last Christmas or the Christmas before. Okay. But that's it. Well, weird because this is also a Christmas case. Is it? Yes. And it was so strange because I was looking There's at something pieces. coming to me. I'm getting something. It's coming. Spirit. I'm getting something. <laughs> Baby, Can you, do you acknowledge that? Please you. acknowledge that. Please acknowledge. Do you know what I mean when I say that? <laughs> do you know do you what, what I mean I'm when saying? I say that? Do you want to say what I'm saying? <laughs> Hopefully that is landing. <laughs> Hopefully now, This is my land. symbol for a butterfly with closed wings. And that means you're a whore. <laughs> like, that's what I mean. Oh my God. Literally. Oh my God. Well, I'm so jealous. I like, I wish I was in your costume right now. Baby, I can ship it. Express, I can I can literally have it to you in like two days. I'm gonna need really that by air. Honestly, I would walk. Your mannerisms like are different. Okay, I'm noticing this. Your mannerisms are different. You keep going. You're like, <laughs> it's the nails. It's the nails, Sunny. I'm gonna be sad when everything. I have to like go like this. Um, but yeah, it's a Christmas case, and it was funny because when I was looking up different <laughs> cases to cover, <laughs> it's a the Christmas one case. the one that kept popping up was DB Cooper. I forgot that that started in Portland. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. But he, but, where did he jump off? Was it somewhere over Reno? It was somewhere in Nevada. Yeah, never found. Never found. And this is also a case of a family that was never found. A proper unsolved disappearance. A proper unsolved disappearance, baby. Because we haven't Let done one in a hot minute, and I'm and I'm up. in the mood. Yeah. All right. Okay. So let me just give you a little bit of a top line on the Martin family. I want to take us back to the year 1958. It's going to be so hard to not do this in Teresa's voice. I'm like, it was December in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> the song Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree by Brenda Lee had just come out. And <laughs> from everything I've read about Portland at Christmas time, it's pretty magical. I mean, the Pacific Northwest is where, you know, it's known for its iconic fir trees. And like many families that lived in that area, when you have some of the most beautiful Christmas trees in the country, you'd often make it a family tradition to drive outside of the city and go pick out your holiday greenery for the season, your wreaths and your bows. Sounds pretty wholesome, right? Packing up your like 1950 station wagon and taking the kids out on a Sunday morning to pick out their tree. Mm -hmm. Well, that is exactly what Kenneth Martin and his wife Barbara had planned to do with their three daughters, Barbie, Virginia, and Susan. But December 7th, 1958 would mark a fateful day in Portland's history, a day that quickly turned from wholesome to eerie. It was the last day that all five members of the family were ever seen again. It's a disappearance case that has haunted the area for over six decades, and after all this time, perhaps the most unnerving detail is that somewhere at the bottom of the Columbia River, there probably lies the Martin family station wagon full of clues that could tell us more about what happened to them that day. But oh. before we unpack and I tap into spirit, 
let me just say welcome back, creepers. To, welcome back, creepers. <laughs> welcome back <laughs> to another episode of Creep Time, the podcast. If you're new here, I'm Teresa Caputo, but I also I'm Stu, and this is my incredible co-host Silas Jean, aka otherwise Louis. known as Lowy. 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 And if you are new here, make sure you follow us, follow us on Apple or if you're listening on Spotify, hit that bell notification so you don't miss a beat with the newest episodes that we're dropping. And if you feel so inclined, babies, you should leave us a review because word of mouth really helps our show grow. And we so appreciate your support. Oh, my gosh. And before we start, Spirit is telling me that I need to take a little shot of my magic minds. I was about to say, I was like, I don't have one at my side, but I wish I did. Tis, tis tradition. Um, tis tradition around these ports. I know. My God. I'm actually so excited <sighs> for this. No, it, it's such a great way. It's so early, too. I was like, I feel like if there's any time to take it, it's going to be mm. now. But oh, oh, my God. I have headphones in this wig. I really can't risk it. I was freaking craving that flavor. That's the like matcha. It's mm. so good. No, it's, I mean, I know we say all the usual stuff. We're always like, you know, it helps you focus. You really don't get the caffeine jitters. But what I kind of hinted at last time was that I'm obsessed with the ease of it yeah. and how quick it is if I'm running out the door and I just want to grab one really mm-hmm. fast and take it in the car. I, we're not supposed to promote this, but I'll plug it anyway. But I love the sleep shots. Those are like one of my favorites. Okay, baby. I got to get those sleep shots. I, I just you have still the don't have them? All I do is the performance. I'm going to make a call. There's going to be a call. <laughs> Spirit is telling me I need to get those sleep shots. You're gonna have to get those sleep shots. No, it's <laughs> I, I actually I haven't checked and it, it's my own fault, but I haven't checked if they're actually available because I rave about them to everybody and they're always like I haven't checked on the website or I didn't see those on the website. Sorry, this scared me. My wig just fell down on my shoulder and I was like, <laughs> but no, they are so fantastic. I think the yeah. reformulation is great. They taste fantastic, and I'm very excited that they're partnering with us for all of October because they want to make sure everybody who wants to try a little bit of Magic Mind is going to get 20% off their first order, whether it is a single time purchase or you're going the full shebang and you're getting a subscription, baby. That's 20% right. off. With Creep Time 20, that is your code. You're going to check the link down in the description. That is going to be your way into Magic Mind. <laughs> I can't with the nails. Check that code. Check that's, that that, link, I, that's what I'm telling you. It changes everything. I know. It changes. Like, even me, I'm like, check your this, code. I'm already on QVC. I'm already. <laughs> I'm like, shop a, shop a mind, lowest stress, better energy. Better focus. Better Magic focus. Mind, better focus. But I literally, it was so funny because I was like, ah. Uh, Maybe I'll make myself another cup of coffee before we record today. And then I was like, actually, no, it'll be, I'll just have my magic mind because it accompanies my coffee so well. Like it kind of mm-hmm. brings me down off the like jittery phase of my coffee. And then I'm just like, but I still feel very like alert and focused. Yeah. Do you, do you get the coffee twitch? Cause I get that sometimes. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. It's always in the side too, where I'm like, I get the coffee twitch under my eye, like right here. It's dark sided. Never get that with magic mind. Say that. Know that. (laughs) Never, baby. Know that. Know that. All right. Well, we're going to put that magic mind to the test because we're going to unpack the Martin family disappearance. Are you ready, baby? I am. And can I just say, just from that top line, um, I'm very curious. So you said this was December 7th, 1958, did you say? Mm -hmm. Yes. Interesting. December 7th, day after my dad's birthday. That's why it like buzzed in my mind. I was like, interesting. Um, um, and were they out Christmas shopping for a tree? They were going to do what they did as a family tradition, which was drive up. They lived in like Portland proper, but there's uh-huh. beautiful gorges and like uh, fir trees that line up this highway towards Columbia River. Mm-hmm. And they were headed up that way to go. I guess what they would do is go like pull greenery off the trees and like make their own wreaths and their own like bows oh, okay yeah and... like like a harvest so they could like get all the stuff for the season yeah um, maybe chop a tree as well mm-hmm. i'm not sure if that was in the cards but that's interesting yeah. and this was their tradition and then they were never seen again which is of course plays into the eeriness of it that it's supposed to be such a happy time of year um and it was something really important to them uh that they did as a tradition so yes I hear it was a car in the background uh-huh uh, a car a core a core a in core. my background? In my background. Oh. That's what I'm going to go. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, baby, all you're going to hear is this charm bracelet. Oh, my God. I didn't even notice the charms. <laughs> so good. This just good. felt Teresa to me. A little charm bracelet. <laughs> yeah, good. Jewelry is just as important as hand accessories. And that's that on that, baby. Actually, you know what's funny? This charm bracelet is, um, I before I launch us in, 
it is every single show I ever did as a little kid, I would go pick out a charm. So I've got one for like Wizard of Oz when I did it. I've got one for like uh I don't know what a cheerleader one would be. That like is Cinderella. So it's like my little like so it's so funny. I like found it. And in my where's the creep box. time one in that show? That I was gonna us. say, baby, it might be the Route 66 one. <laughs> I don't know what show that would be from. <laughs> But anyways, because we're going on tour, babies. Um, that we are. We are going we are. on tour. Forgot yeah. to mention that. But I Creepers, know, if you are looking to get your tickets, the reason we're covering a Portland case today is because we are going in succession of the dates we're going to be playing for the Western dates. So there will be Los Angeles, Sacramento, Portland, and then we'll do Seattle, Salt Lake City, Denver, Phoenix, and then Albuquerque at the Haunted Chemo Theater. So if you want to come out for a night of scary stories and true crime with Silas and Stu or Louis and Teresa, Teresa. please go to creeptime.com. <laughs> live readings for everybody. That'd be so funny, but oh so terrible. God. Like, I know. <laughs> but who in the room has the father? Who? who has the father figure? Anybody? I'm terrible. getting something. But what but I yes. will say, this when we go to Portland, I if we have time, I do want to drive up to where this gorge is because the idea that this car is just sitting at the bottom of this river somewhere and we'll get into all of the details and like what lies beneath, but it would be, it's just crazy to me that they've never found it and it would be such a big break in this case, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that in just a little bit, but if we have time, we should drive up there. A place where people went off a cliff into a, into a ravine. I just, no, I just want to like, I, I want to see how vast it is because it seems so crazy to me that they haven't been able to find anything after so many clues ended up coming to the surface so really yeah and so I just am huh. like it must be but from everything I've read it's a it's a big endeavor I guess and they're very dangerous waters to dive into but what about I sonar just, somehow they funded using sonar to try to find Nessie we can't use this to try to find people Baby, this is what I've been preaching and praying and saying. Honestly, well, that's what I was thinking when I was doing baby. the research. Exactly, baby. That's another costume idea right there. Oh, I thought about it. <laughs> it's just It just, just came to my mind just now. <laughs> just now to your magic mind. Okay, so let me take us back. So it's Sunday morning, December 7th, 1958. Sometime between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. that afternoon, Ken Martin, 54 years old, packed up his 1954 red and cream-colored Ford Squire station wagon along with his wife, Barbara. He was 48, and their three daughters, Barbie, Virginia, and Susie. Barbie was 14, Virginia was 13, and Susie was 11. Uh, Like I said, they were planning on driving out east. Yeah, all very young. Oh, and actually, I have pictures for you. I should drop you a link so you can see. they were. Yeah, what the hell? I know. Where's that link, baby? They're pretty precious little girls. Um, Let me show you. Is this in chat? It's going to be in the chat, baby. Hopefully okay. What's see. going on? Because, like, they were doing hyperlinks, and now they're not. So they're rolling it back. Somebody at Riverside is toying with me. <laughs> I was going to say, we need and I can tell. to submit a ticket. Okay, I'm in. You got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So those are the three girls um, and their two parents. You can see. Um, I wish I had included... There's another really sweet picture that gets passed around a lot in the research, but it's like the three girls all posing in like their PJs. I don't know if it's for the Christmas card or a Christmas picture, but uh, Mm -hmm. they were all very close, very like 1950s cookie cutter kind of family. And Christmas time was a very special time around the Martin house. They lovingly referred to their home as, quote, Martin Manor. And Ken, their father, would often dress up as Santa Claus and was known in the neighborhood for creating what he and his little girls called quote, Candy Lane. I found this in an old newspaper article, but Ken made it a tradition to go to neighbors' houses and offer to decorate them with large plastic candy canes on their doors. And this was just one of the many Christmas traditions that they had. And the night before that the Martins went missing, Ken and his wife had actually attended a Christmas party. So they were really getting in the full swing of the season. It was one of their favorite times of the year. Okay. Cut, to the, cut to the next morning. And surprisingly, the weather was shaping up to be nice for an afternoon drive. I was surprised to see this, but the weather in Portland at the time was warmer than I guess I had expected. It was about 55 degrees. And given the region, there's usually precipitation and fog. But all of the weather reports showed that it was going to clear up and be a pretty good day for a long drive. 
Hmm. Before the Martins headed out that afternoon, they actually received a visit from their family friends, the Evans, whose two children were similar ages to their daughters, and they had a little play date. The Evans actually ended up inviting them over later that evening for Sunday dinner at another mutual friend's home, the Welches. But the Martins said, no, you know what? We've got a plan. We're going to go up the highway uh, to go look for our Christmas greens. But they tell them, thank you for the invite. And the Welch family ended up calling their house shortly thereafter, extending an invite personally. But once again, Ken says they ought to stick to their plan. They ought to get going soon towards the country. And eventually the Evans left sometime before 1 p.m. I only call this out because I think it's a bizarre thing to think about that twice fate might have tried to stop them from getting in that car that day. Hmm. That is a bit eerie. Yeah. Shortly after this, they began their drive east, and we know that they made it at least 40 miles out based on two locations where uh, we have evidence that they visited. And I have maps, I believe, because it's a little tricky to keep up with just how far east they second page? are driving up. Yeah, it's on the second page. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. The first was a gas station located in an area called Cascade Locks. Uh, it's hmm. about 42 miles up from Portland where a receipt would later be discovered for the purchase of five gallons of gas. This was back in the day when credit card receipts were often mailed back to you. And there was no timestamp on it, but the gas station owner had it on record that it was his seventh sale of the day. Sorry, Police... there's a car alarm going off. <laughs> oh, you're good. You're good. Hold there's tight. just cars. I'm also riding. curious about what you just said. You said a credit card receipt. I didn't realize that people, I didn't realize credit cards were a thing in the 50s. This there, is brand new information. I think it was pretty new that people had credit cards. And so your receipt would actually come mailed to you a couple of weeks later after your transaction. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't know that either. And I also was like, "Wait, how so... did they find the receipt later on?" And it was. Well, I guess mailed. Yeah, it's so risky. I guess maybe not risky. I don't know. I'm trying to think from the POV of a credit card company because there's no like computer transaction going on. It's all just like taking down numbers, keeping records, and then charging a bank later. So I'm just like, "Huh, that's so interesting." Yeah, never thought about it. It just really is a sign of the times, and a sign of the times that it becomes a key piece of evidence, but it wouldn't be discovered until a couple of weeks after they actually disappeared. So hmm. it also stinks because had they had that receipt much earlier, they would have maybe made more progress at the very beginning of the investigation. But uh, police wouldn't know about it until two weeks after the Martins went missing. And we'll come back to the significance of the receipt too. Okay. The second location where they had been spotted was a diner uh, called the Paradise Snack Bar located near the Hood River, which was another 20 miles east of Cascade Locks where they had gotten gas. So presumably they had stopped for gas, driven some more, stopped for a bite, and then were most likely headed home based on eyewitness accounts. A waitress named Clara York had waited on them at the Paradise Snack Bar. She came mm -hmm. forward later once the search for the Martin family was made public, and she recounted that they were, quote, real nice people and seemed quite happy. They said they had been riding around and had been hunting a Christmas tree. She recalled that she remembered the girls ordered hamburgers and fries, which I know sounds like an unlikely clue, but just remember that. She stated that they left the restaurant heading west at around 4.15 p.m., presumably back towards Portland. Interesting. So the whole family was in positive spirits, it sounds mm -hmm. like. The like everybody, nothing seemed off, nothing seemed nothing strange, seemed according to, to this one witness. Yes, Part of the reason she remembered them so well, too, was that they were the only people dining at the Paradise Snack Bar. That is, aside from two other men that were sitting in a booth. By all accounts, Clara York and perhaps the two men in the restaurant were likely the last people to ever see the Martins again. Now, when do the Martins go missing, and when does everyone start to grow suspicious that the Martins are missing? Well, on Monday morning, December 8th, Ken doesn't show up for work at the Eckley's Electric Home Service Company, where he was usually very punctual. His boss, Taylor Eccles, who was the owner, said that he almost always showed up before him. So when he didn't spot his work truck that morning at around 7.45 a.m., he knew that something was off. Hmm. At the same time, Susan and Virginia Martin have been reported absent by their teachers at Rose City School, where their aunt actually was a teacher. So when... The aunt realizes that she hadn't seen both of her nieces and that 
Barbara, their mother, hadn't left a note or call to say that the girls would be out, she became concerned. So she ends up calling Grant High School where Barbie, the eldest daughter, went to school to see if she had showed up to school that day. And disturbingly, she's also marked absent. Charlotte, the aunt, continues with her day. I'm not sure if she didn't, if she just wanted to wait it out or she didn't want to panic, but it wasn't. Not overreact or anything like that. Yeah, but it wasn't around until 930 that evening when a call comes to Multnomah County Police from one of Ken's co-workers that they, it, his name was uh, Edward. The boss, Taylor, had advised him, go ahead and call the police and tell them that Ken Martin is missing. Some, something's got to be off here. Mm-hmm. So county police led by a detective named Walter Graben, who would take a profound interest in this case for the rest of his life, headed over to the Martin family home at around 11 o'clock p.m. to gather more clues. And from that same newspaper clipping I read, it was reported that when police walked in, the scene looked like one of a family that would be coming back later on. Their Sunday morning paper was still laid out on the counter. I think the girls had been scrapbooking that day or that morning with the Evans. Mm-hmm. And so they had okay. laid out some papers on the table. There were no, breakfast- like nobody was getting out of town. No bags were packed. No, nothing no. substantial that was missing. No, there were breakfast dishes sitting in the sink, load of clothes in the washer. So okay. yeah, it yeah. looked like they were coming back home. And once police learned, I assume from the Evanses, that they had planned to go up the highway to gather their Christmas tree, they asked around for tips as to where the family would normally go to look for their tree, and they're pointed in the direction of an area called Larch Mountain. This is where Graven and his team start their investigation and their search efforts. And geographically, Larch Mountain is further south of Cascade Locks and the Columbia River, the areas with the confirmed sightings that I told you about previously. So, unfortunately, they start searching for the Martins pretty quickly, but not in the place that they should have been. And as we know, those first couple of days in a search effort can be pretty crucial. So this was a really unfortunate, misguided lead. So I'm going to pause. Do you have any initial feelings around the Martin family or the setup for the day that they disappeared I mean, it could have been um, inconsequential, but you mentioned it, so my my ears perked up when you talked about it. So it could, you know, be entirely irrelevant to the story. But you mentioned the two men who last saw them when they were in that little like cafe or diner. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they're going to be relevant to the story later on, but just curious if that is something I should pay attention to. Oh, they're going to be relevant. Spirit is stepping forward. They're going to be pretty relevant. Okay, it's yeah, it's that. It's definitely the intent that it appeared that everybody wanted to come back. It seems like there's nothing that's left even to the effect of like maybe like a suicide note coming from the father or something. I'm trying to think of like stories that I've read and parents who do something horrible mm-hmm. out in the wild or out in the wilderness with their family in a car. Kind of like an Aunt Diane situation or something like that. Similar, yeah. There's a different story that I'm thinking of, which we should actually cover. Um, I'm not actually sure where it took place, but Creepers, if you're listening, you'll you'll know this one for sure, of like these two moms um, who had a bunch of adopted children and they drove a car off a cliff with everyone inside. Oh, That's the f- first thing that came to my mind because I'm, think- I'm in my mind this is playing like they're traveling up the mountains. So I was mm-hmm. wondering if maybe the father left something behind, some kind of a clue. But it's very possible that it has nothing to do with him and his intent. It has something to do with someone on the outside. Yeah. This case also takes quite a turn in a way that you, I don't think, will expect. Um, okay. But yeah, I, I, but it's it's interesting because as I was doing the research, I was wondering, okay, what's going to be the motive for this car having gone off the road from the parents or from the father. Like I thought the exact mm-hmm. same you did, S- same thing you did. And I didn't see, there were a couple of theories about him, but most of the research points totally in a different direction. One of which is those two men that were in, in the booth in the restaurant. Whew. Okay. So it wasn't until that gas receipt I mentioned earlier was discovered about two weeks later by Ken's sister when she goes to grab the mail from the family home. Here was their first indication that, oh, shoot, they were driving in a different direction. They had also received plenty of tips from eyewitnesses that claimed to have seen a family driving a similar Ford station wagon near Larch Mountain, which I'm sure there were lots of them. It was a very popular car. I was going to say it was like, how could one distinguish unless they're looking at like specific color or license plate? 
Exactly. So the police had sort of been on a wild goose chase up until this point, but now they know they've got to look in the direction of the Columbia River and up toward Cascade Locks. Thankfully, the community got super involved in the search efforts. Many people pitched in to help out with searches along the river. I even saw a report that one man walked 81 miles up and down the Columbia River searching for them by foot. Because remember, things like this didn't happen back in the 1950s. This was very disturbing. It was rare that an entire family could just disappear. Especially, Do you know anything about like the news coverage at the time of it? Like how big the story was locally? It, it got pretty big locally. I mean, some of the headlines that I saw, they came out... I believe the one that really shook everybody to their core came out in January of 1959. Um, but locally, it got it got a lot of coverage. And that one newspaper article that I kept citing, I think, was actually from an Indiana newspaper. So I mm. think it must have gotten some national coverage. But this definitely was a big headline in the Portland area. Mm. So let's see here. Uh, especially a family like the Martins who were happy and known for their love of this time of year. It just made it seem like something was so off about the situation. Now, those two men that were at the Paradise Snack Bar the same mm-hmm. day that the Martins went missing, they're going to come back into the fold here in a very odd way. Police start receiving tips that a sketchy looking Chevy sedan had been abandoned off the side of the highway about eight miles away from the gas station where the Martins had gotten their gas. The car looked off. It had all these cobbled together parts, an out-of-state license plate, and when they go to tow it, it's revealed as a stolen car from Los Angeles, which they suspect was taken by an ex-convict. And I guess because the case is still cold to this day, and he could technically still be alive, they have never officially released the name of this ex-con that they believe stole this car. But most people refer to him as Lester Price or LP in the research. So I'm going to call him Lester P or LP throughout the rest of the story. Okay. Well, here's where the odd connection comes in. Actually, two odd connections come in. Detective Graven had remembered when he spoke to Mrs. York, the waitress at the Paradise Snack Bar, that two other men were there while the Martins were dining. He goes back to the drawing board and confirms that those two other men were, in fact, Lester P., and another convict named Roy Light. This is confirmed by Mrs. York because she actually knew Roy fairly well. He lived up in that area, and he was a local. He frequented that restaurant. Got it. Okay. But but that wasn't the only weird connection. See, there weren't just three Martin children. There was actually a fourth child named Donald, but Donald Martin was older. Wait, is that who I saw in the pictures? Yes, Donald Martin's on that first I was wondering. I was like, who the hell is this guy? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And he's much older than the rest of his uh, siblings. He was 28. He -hmm. lived in New York where he was stationed with the Navy. And from multiple sources that I read, Donald didn't have the best relationship with his parents. I also read a couple of reports that he was gay and had a bit of a strained relationship with his parents because of this. And on top of that, he had also had a run-in with the law four years prior to his family's disappearance. And this was where that second strange connection to these men would come into play. Before Donald had moved to New York to be stationed with the Navy, he had worked at a department store in Portland where he was eventually caught stealing about $2,000 worth of merchandise. That's a lot for the time period. A lot. I think I read somewhere, I think it was like 30000 maybe, if that's even possible. Don't. I don't want to misquote myself on that, but it was a lot to be stealing. I mean, two grand at the time, like, yeah, that probably could have equated to that. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember, I used to have a book. Um, this is very random, but um, because my mom was born in 1960, so somebody gave her a book of like the year 1960 of how much everything cost. Yeah. And I remember the cost of a brand new luxury car was like... $2,800 in that book. So I guess that would make sense if that was the equivalent of like, I don't know, $35,000 maybe yeah. today. Yeah. Which would be the cost of a brand new luxury car. So that's just, it's making it, me think, it's my own, own little like mental inflation calculator. Yeah. Well, it wasn't just pennies. I mean, he was stealing a lot of stuff and it was also, he worked in. And it was accumulated, right? It, it wasn't was just like one hit. Right. Right. Um, It was like kind of a slow burn sort of situation. And at the time when he eventually got caught, He told his boss that he recognized his mistake. He had been really going through a rough time. He wasn't charged, just fired. 
but most of the items he stole were from the sporting goods department. Like I said, that's where he worked. And one of which was actually a 38 caliber Colt commander pistol, which was apparently never returned to the department store. Now the connection here to these two ex-cons, Roy and Lester, comes through a friend that Donald worked with at the department store, a guy named Wayne. And Wayne and Lester were allegedly acquaintances. I scoured the internet to try to find more information on how they knew each other because I really wanted to make sure that this was a sound theory if I'm going to tie this all together. But apparently Wayne taught PE at a local high school, and that was the connection that I kept seeing to Lester P. I'm not Mm. sure if at some point Lester had also worked at the high school, but there was some sort of a connection between the two of them. And it's just a super odd coincidence. But this is the second strike against this man, Lester P., and having any sort of relationship to the Martin family. Now, the pistol, that 38 caliber pistol, is also at the center of this. And I'll come back to that in just a second. And at this point, the thread that at this point, the thread that most everybody had pulled on was that the Martin family drove off the side of the cliff. Mr. Martin had probably lost control of the station wagon and the family was presumably somewhere in the Columbia River. Mm -hmm. Detectives had been searching for weeks upon weeks. They had hired divers, special boats, and the search was becoming very expensive. It was an extensive search across multiple jurisdictions of county police and they weren't coming up with any major clues. That is until January of 1959 when a local guy who sort of dubbed himself as a like an amateur detective named Donald Bain made one of the most important discoveries of this entire investigation. This is where uh, news coverage really started to blow up. He ends up finding tire tracks on a cliffside in what's called the Dales area, and he spots cream colored paint chips along the rocks. And if you remember, the Mm. Martin family station wagon was painted red and cream. Investigators start to think to themselves, okay, wow, this could be it. This could be where they drove off. And Detective Graven wrote in his notebook, quote, there were no return marks to show that this particular vehicle returned and apparently was either pushed or driven off of the cliff. So we're getting our first indication that something more sinister could have been at play here. They could have been pushed off. Well, I was just about to say, I was like, would paint chips on a car usually break off or fall off unless there was some kind of a collision? Well, a collision or if the car was pushed off the cliff, it just like nosedive right down and then doom, 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 like all of the, the rattling of the bracelet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. ASMR, baby. Uh, the paint chips would have come off as the car made Got it. Down. That's what it is. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it would have made its way very far down. It would have been about a 20-foot-plus drop. And the water below was about 110 feet deep. Some of the paint chips were actually sent to the FBI for analysis. And when it was revealed that they were, in fact, from the exact same make and model of the Martin Station Wagon, United States Army Corps of Engineers were admitted to lower the level of the river by about five feet. And it was searched with sonar technology, like you were kind of uh, alluding to earlier, but nothing came of it. Detective Graven pleads to have more divers and more investigative searches done in these immediately surrounding waters, but the county police don't comply. Perhaps it was a resource thing. Some of the reports I read said that those waters were way too dangerous for divers and they never end up doing an extensive search of those waters below the rocks with the cream-colored paint chips Mm. and tire tracks. Pausing for a moment of silence for County. I really don't understand after all of this time, they still, both of these counties, it became clearer to me as I researched this that the only person that was really heavily invested or seemingly heavily invested was Detective Graven and everybody Mm -hmm. else was kind of like, they drove off the side of the cliff let's go ahead and put a bow on this. It's over. Let's stop looking for sinister things. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of sinister things, let's go back to that pistol. Uh, The one that Donald stole when he was working at the department store in Portland years prior. A couple of weeks after these tracks were found, a 38 caliber Colt pistol, same model, was found with dry blood on the handle not far from where that Chevy owned by Lester P or stolen by Lester P had been abandoned. The gun also had one of nine bullets fired from the chamber. 
At first, police didn't think that the gun had any connection to the case. Right. Later, they discovered that the serial number traced back to being sold at the exact same department store where Donald's Shut son worked. Mm-hmm. And like I mentioned, oh my god, I, it was oh. the, I know it was the exact same model as the gun that he stole. But this wasn't enough evidence to prove it was his gun or a murder weapon connected to the Martins, and thus it was never entered into evidence. But what happened it, to it? It was returned to the owner. The son? The uh, the person that found it. Oh, oh, gotcha. They just returned it back to him. I, I, I was like, the son is the presumed suspect who last yeah. had that gun. <laughs> no. I was like, he gets the gun returned to him, and they go, this probably isn't enough. Yeah, so Sorry go. about your family. <laughs> no, I think the guy's name was Theodore that ended up discovering it, but they, they end up <laughs> <Irrelevant>. basically <laughs> looking at it, and then they decide they can't do anything with it, so they give it back to him. That is so... Bizarre. I mean, not I totally like out of character. Like I'm not that shocked by it, I guess, but just bizarre. Bizarre. Well, that's the thing. There's so many strange coincidences in this case. And now Detective Graven was considering more and more that the disappearance of the Martins might not have been an accident and foul play might be more likely here after all. So Graven starts looking at Donald and thinking about a possible motive that he might have had to put his family in harm's way. Mm -hmm. With a possible hit through his friends or his connections, though very loose to some ex-cons. But it seems so crazy. He's out all the way in New York to have orchestrated this. I guess the idea of this being done back then and that far away, I mean, it seems pretty incredible to me personally, but I guess it's not totally impossible. Uh, I don't know what you think about that. Well, I'm very curious about what is known of their traditions, you know, like how... Mm -hmm vocal were they about what they did every single year around the same Saturday or the same like weekend day whenever it happened every December to do this where the son would have intimate knowledge about like I know on a Sunday in early December the first Sunday of the month they go up into these woods looking yeah. for decor decorations for the truth like maybe a tree they're going to be there if you just wait you can it's- stop at this cafe point because they're going to stop there it's that's really astute of you to recognize because that was part of I saw that come up a couple of times and I didn't include it because it was mostly hearsay, but that Donald could have he could have potentially called that day in the morning and told the family like, hey, you should drive up or you should go get your Christmas tree today. Well, do you know what day of the week it was? It, it was, was a, a Sunday. Day. It was a, a Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. yeah. And it was the se- the seventh day of the week. It's the first Sunday of December. I mean, mm-hmm. The timing of it is so specific, it would be difficult for me to assume that that's not their tradition. Yeah. And only a family member would have intimate knowledge of that. Maybe you could say some friends would as well, especially if they vocalize it. But that's pretty compelling to me, the idea Mm -hmm. that if he's going to put a hit on his family, he's like, they're going to be going up to this place. They always stop at this cafe every year. He's old enough to know the traditions. Yeah. It's it's so spooky to think about. Just just for me personally, to think about him having conducted that if it's true from all the way over on the other side of the country I get, well i guess the mysterious thing about it is it's his stolen pistol so mm-hmm. why was that the weapon of well choice that was... we don't know if it's his that's the only thing we know it was sold at that department store we again know somebody's pissing same. on my leg and telling I me know, it's raining I know, girl I know. <laughs> somebody hey, uh, I'm, I'm getting a sensation on the leg uh yeah it's but it's not his. So they can't enter it into evidence. They can't like definitively say it belonged to Donald. But I mean, what the heck? What are the chances? What are the well, chances? They, they can't say it didn't. So I'm going to keep it on the table. I know. Now, here's where we get potentially our biggest break in this entire case. On May 1st of 1959, mm-hmm. a barge is dropping an anchor in the Columbia River near the Dales where those tire tracks were initially found back in January. Yeah. The anchor lodges itself onto something large, and crew members on board said that they, when they hit that object, they ended up essentially poking down, I imagine, with a pipe of some sort or some sort of tool just to see how hard its surface was, the object that they had crashed into. And they claimed that when they hit it, it felt like some sort of metal. Some of them actually went on to report that it could have definitely been the, quote, size of a car, But they ended up not doing a proper search of the area. The sailors eventually unhooked from whatever it was, and they kept going on their merry way. 
Now, I say that's a huge break in this case because two days later, on May 3rd, Sue Martin's body is discovered by fishermen at around 6 o'clock in the morning along the river near Cascade Locks. The very next day, May 4th, Virginia Martin's body <gasps> is discovered near the Bonneville Dam about four miles west. I think I... Did I include a picture? I think I have for you... Oh, hold, hold on. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's pause. Uh, okay. Sorry. I did not expect that. I was I know. stunned for a second. It's it's insane so whatever they hit most likely if it was the car maybe it was a door or could a windshield it be the roof. yeah windshield but it well because that's the thing because like most time when a body is submerged i just covered a case about this but when a body is submerged eventually through like decomposition and like gas that builds up it will start to it will try to surface the body is going to try to float yeah the only thing that could stop it would be something that it's like sealed in which would be a car Unless you're busting out a windshield. Mm -hmm. Isn't that so eerie to think about? That they hit that thing, they keep going, and then all of a sudden, one, two, there they yeah, are. Just like inadvertently freeing the bodies that have been trapped in, in those waters. for How long after they had disappeared was this This was done? five months later. Oh, God. This was May, and the girls had disappeared December 7th, the year before. And they were able to identify them visually or because there was no DNA or anything. Based on dental records. Dental records. That's what it gotcha. Mm -hmm. And in their autopsies, uh, Sue's cause of death is drowning and Virginia's is the same. However, Virginia's autopsy report does have a statement that says, quote, showing head with hole in head, which some have thought could have possibly been a bullet from that 38 caliber pistol where only one bullet had been fired. Because... Uh -huh. Yeah. And I'm amazed that they were able to discover this as well. The bodies were fairly well preserved, I guess, after, like you were saying, in water and after all those colder months. But they were able to corroborate the story the waitress had told about what they had eaten that day. The girls had, in fact, uh, eaten hamburgers and fries within two hours of their deaths. A funeral service was eventually held for the girls at the end of May, which Donald did not attend. But he did eventually make his way back to Portland. Part of my research uh, involved watching a documentary about this. And he did end up sitting down with Detective Graven, who at this point, I think, had started to build a pretty sizable case in his head against Donald. Mm -hmm. And I think I included a picture for you. I think it's on the last page. The I guess a newspaper came and took photos of them when they first met. Uh, but Donald said to him, quote, I know of no one who would murder my folks or no reason for it, but I don't see how it could have been an accident. Do you do you find that as interesting as I do that he gets there and he just immediately starts to kind of fit the narrative of, oh, yeah, this is definitely foul play. Do you think that says anything about his involvement one way or the other? Difficult to say. I think it's actually I mean, if he was somebody who was trying to cover his tracks, I think it's actually probably a smart move. Yeah, because that's a natural thing. Maybe I think especially for families that I think start to become uh, kind of irrational when like tragedy strikes their family, mm -hmm. like a disappearance like this, whereas most people would assume it's Occam's razor. They went off a cliff or something like that. I think a family will often push in the experience of my research. A family will often push to say there's more to the story. We have to look for more. So mm -hmm. In my view, he's doing the thing that I think a family member would most naturally do if they were grief stricken. But that could be him covering his tracks is my point. Yeah, I could. I, yeah, I didn't think about it like that because I think I definitely would. If I'm grieving, probably my first thing I would go to was, well, somebody must have done this. Something Like there's no way that this could have possibly happened. This we have looked at so many cases, accident. so many cases where you and I both will come to some kind of conclusion where we're like, it feels like it's Occam's razor. It feels like I'm thinking of um, Tiffany Valiente, to be honest, yeah. and how that family has so consistently pushed to say that there is something that went on here. She was trapped in the woods. She was chased in the woods. She might have been assaulted in the woods, pushed in front of the train, laid in front of the train after she was already dead. When in reality, it's very possible that she may have just jumped in front of the train. Yeah. So I think we often do see family members who do sort of push for that initial investigation, because that still means that there's some twisted form of like life and interest mm -hmm. to the person. They don't want mm -hmm. to put it to bed just yet. I guess the only thing I was thinking was that because of the times, I wasn't sure if somebody that wouldn't have been 
so in the loop on the communication of what exactly people were thinking in that locally in that Jesus area. Jesus Christ. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Duck nail gone. What you also like- keep flying away from the mic. You're like, I mean, I guess if he had gone up in the building. Oh, am I? <laughs> <laughs> it's not that bad. Because <laughs> you'll, you'll go like, you're like, um, I don't Maybe he did do that. <laughs> it's just I'm tapping into something. I'm. I can tell you're looking unknown. up and you're seeing things in there, and I know it. I can and, and tell. My full medium brain is happening. <laughs> I just I didn't know if maybe because of the times he wouldn't have known much about the investigation, and so he was gets really, there. That's my question too. Like, how public was some of this suspicion? I don't think it was such national news that would have traveled all the way to New York, and he also just seemed. But like sort of, for him intimately with the family and like the investigators, because they're yeah. who's going to know. Right. I guess the other thing is he didn't seem so interested in he didn't show up to search. He didn't show up for the funeral. So I was just sort of wondering, does that also say anything? Well, to be clear, I don't think that this spells his innocence. I just yeah. think that it spells that maybe maybe he's maybe not even knowingly is covering his tracks in a smart mm-hmm. way. Mm hmm. Yeah, I can see that. I'd say that the one theory that Detective Graven certainly leaned towards was that foul play was involved and that Donald Mm -hmm. was potentially involved, presumably to get back at his parents for not loving him or recognizing him for who he was. On the last page of his notebook, Detective Graven wrote, I think I have a picture of it for you in uh, the Canva link, Uh, but it said, quote, had to be planned by blank where a name was scratched out. And oh, then, I was going to say, I was like, did you scratch that out? Or is that No, he scratched it out. And then, quote, no one else with motive. Shortly after the funeral services for the Martin girls, Detective Graven ends up writing a report called Coincidences in the Martin Case. And he mm-hmm. claims that he's not trying to paint the picture of foul play. But in his report, he also cites an eyewitness statement that was pretty telling. He cites a couple's testimony that they saw what appeared to be a white and red station wagon driving incredibly fast down the highway where the Martin family would have been driving. It's called Highway 30. And Mm -hmm. then later that evening, they passed what appeared to be the exact same station wagon again, only this time it was pulled over on the side of the road and two men were outside of the station wagon talking to whoever was inside of it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Graven's report, however, was not very well received by the rest of the county police force. I think, like I said earlier, most of the force, which just a reminder, there's at least two jurisdictions here. It's Multnomah County and I read Hood River County police were also involved and they're pretty much ready to go ahead and call this an accident. It's been an extremely expensive and extensive investigation. And Mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, my opinion, allegedly, like I've already said, they just kind of wanted to wrap this thing up. Yeah. I also saw another super odd theory, though not heavily backed up in the research. So take this with a grain of salt, that Walter Graven suspected that Barbie, the 14 year old, might have been pregnant and that Donald's friend Wayne from the department store might have been the father. His connection to the gun and Lester and Roy might point us in the direction that he wanted her dead. But did Donald help arrange a hit on his family? Or could the Martin family have arranged to meet with Wayne to confront him? The only evidence to back this up was that Barbara Martin had taken Barbie Martin to a doctor's appointment out in Vancouver, Washington, a month before they went missing, which was pretty bizarre. She had local doctors in Portland. Yeah, but sometimes, oh, okay, I've got I've got thoughts. Yeah. Oh, tell me your thoughts. Well, I'm just, I mean, think of how many reasons there could be in the 1950s that you're going to go out of town. I know. Far out of town to take your daughter to a doctor's appointment or a specialist, right? Where you don't want people seeing you going into, um, who who would be a doctor who, I mean, I guess your primary care physician could handle could your pregnancy, it. but you could be, is there a, like a NATO profession? What am I thinking of? Um, I mean, uh, like OBGYN? <laughs> I guess it would be an OBGYN. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like, um, I mean, unless they were going, do you think she was getting an abortion? I, I don't know. Well, the other. Well, thing... that's that's a another thing that you would take your daughter out of town for in the 50s. You're going right. to a place where abortion. like you don't want to. Well, you don't want to see anybody in town like seeing your 14 year old daughter walk into the OBGYN and people are right. going to whisper. 
The only other weird thing I saw too was that the waitress at the Paradise Snack Bar said that when Barbie went to order, she also wanted hamburgers and fries. And her mom quickly was like, no, you don't, that's not healthy. So she could have still been pregnant. And because her mom was like, don't eat that. Like, like telling her to eat a healthier option. It was like tuna or something. Like it would be healthier for the baby. Very convoluted theory, but I did see that. No, no, no. But there's it's not for nothing. Like there's significance to that. Like why? And I mean, it could be as simple as just like a very toxic mother daughter relationship. If she's the eldest daughter or something, and she's like, no, 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 no. don't eat that because it'll make you fat or something like that. Yeah, like, that's a very that could be a very fifties mentality. It could be as simple as that, or maybe she's concerned if she already had like some baby weight if she was starting to show. I don't know mm-hmm. how far along she would be in this scenario, but. I think the significance of that, if that is confirmed, that doctor's appointment, is that real? It's confirmed. Yeah. There are only so many ways I can slice that. I'm sorry. I know. But then the weird thing, my charm bracelet just got trapped. I'm like handcuffed. <laughs> um, the only That's weird thing, spirit. though, that is spirit. The only weird thing, why would Donald protect, it's just weird that he would help orchestrate the hit through Wayne. Or for Wayne, for his friend, put his friend. Uh, on I think a two things can be true. Family. I think two things yeah. can be true. I don't know that the I don't know that the the hit has to do with the pregnancy. I just think the pregnancy could be like an, an additional detail to all of this, and then yeah. people are like backfilling a theory because of the pregnancy detail. Mm. I think if there was a hit put on the family, and that hole in the head, wouldn't they be able to tell if it was a bullet hole versus like? a puncture hole or like something from blunt force trauma or something, the impact I, maybe. I think the body was pretty, I mean, they were pretty well, well preserved because they had been underwater for so long. But from what I could see that it's been such a long time since they've gone back and been able to like find those autopsies. And there's only one photo, even of the girls, it's like some horrible photocopy um, that the body was pretty decomposed that they couldn't tell exactly if it was a bullet hole. Can't you tell from the bone, like the skull? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not an examiner. I, I don't know. The only piece of research that I even saw was an autopsy report, like the actual report. And it just said hole in head. Right. Because they just like jot down notes while they're looking yeah. at the body and then like wrap it up in their conclusion. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Because a hole in the head could be like something from like blunt force trauma. If she hit her head on like a gear shift or something yeah. upon the impact and has like a full puncture into her mm-hmm. skull versus like an actual bullet. Because that, I mean, if there's a bullet hole, then we have a completely different story here. But if it's just a hole in the head from the impact or it's kind of nondescript, I don't know that I can concede to this being anything other than maybe a fatal accident of falling off the cliff. Right. Take the wrong turn. Because you're right. I mean, the only way that this happens in a scenario where it wasn't an accident is with motive of the sun. I just find it difficult to believe that he would try to orchestrate killing his whole family just off of one, just off of being excluded, but maybe not. Yeah, just to get back at them. I will also mention that they, the whole story about him being uh, gay, they had apparently shipped him off to like a Christian school when he was, but, but it said Christian, like, college or something and I'm like well he would have been 24 at the time he got shipped off to college at 24 but I guess back then maybe that would have been a thing but yeah. he could have I mean, not everybody went to college upset. so maybe it wasn't yeah. as common to like go there and be around a bunch of 18 year olds or something yeah I, I that, that could have been motive that they kind of like shipped him off um but I mean certainly the motive could have been that he had this you know pretty strained relationship he felt like he just kind of got tossed to the wayside did his family have a lot of money? They weren't super, super wealthy, but his estate that he inherited was about $370,000 in today's, or actually, uh, it, back then's cash. That's a lot of money. Yeah, that's that's, that's a lot, a of, lot money. of money, actually. Yeah, yeah. A brand so, new home in 1960 cost about $13,000. That's yeah. a lot of money. Okay, well, maybe it was actually today's cash. <laughs> I oh, should go back to research. I'm I was like, like it's gotta be one of those. 300 grand yeah. in 1958. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. Yeah, because that was my only other thing. I was like, I mean, there could be multiple things happening where like one, it's to, it's, it's a little bit like the Menendez brothers. It's like to get back at the parents, but it's also about trying to 
take your revenge certainly by like recouping what is left behind in a way. I don't know though. Yeah, I don't know. I just, uh, I certainly think that the whole Barbie being pregnant element, I don't know if that's exactly, I don't know if that for me tracks that that would be his motivation to want to go and say, okay, this is, this is the thread I'll pull on that my friend is like, I got your sister pregnant and I want her dead. And he yeah, says, there, okay, let's th- do it. Any like follow up with that friend? Anybody ever like question him extensively or like chat about this or was he there, looked at? There, he was looked at, but years later, there was a book written by a guy named JB Fisher, I think, where he ended up sitting down with him years later and talking about the disappearance and his relationship to him at the department store. And actually he was the one that Donald had confided in that he was gay. And Wayne was the one that was saying like, he was the one that ended up shedding light on how that was the whole strain between Donald and his family and why he ended up going away to New York. So Wayne does hold some of the cards here just in terms of knowing more information about that strange yeah yeah, yeah he's not exactly just like on the outskirts of the family he has mm-hmm. some like knowledge that intertwines them that's interesting too i didn't yeah. think about that hmm. so is the theory if wayne was involved if there is a theory that the the hit was orchestrated by the son and wayne mm-hmm. is somehow involved is it twofold where they wanted to they didn't know maybe that she had gotten an abortion or maybe she didn't get an abortion so was the attempt to just take her out and the family was collateral on the part of Wayne and it was assisted by the son. I don't think so. I I mean, no. cause how, cause how would you keep the rest of the family quiet? No, but that's what I'm saying. They were collateral. Yeah. Like, I mean, if like it was so pressing to him, which is also a very difficult motive for me to like build out in my mind, right, but yeah. I, I suppose anything is possible in a human mind. But I'm like, if he was so insistent, like this girl cannot be pregnant i don't know what oh. kind of family situation yeah. he came from where maybe this would have been disastrous for him to have she was 14 at the time right mm-hmm. high school mm-hmm. to have a 14 year old girl pregnant because of him if that would have ruined his life so he's like she has to die and the fa- and i'll get them when they're out in the middle of nowhere as a family and the whole family is going to be collateral mm-hmm. yeah i can see that it's pretty it just seems like a dark. Pretty, it's insanely dark. <laughs> insanely dark and also a lot of risk involved. You've got four other players, one of which is the father that's gonna probably be the one operating the heavy machinery that's gonna be, you know, the tough one that's gonna put up a fight. Mm-hmm. That that would be a pretty intense and tall ask on, you know, Wayne's part of those two convicts if they're involved. Well, the, yeah, the convicts are a totally different set of circumstances here because they, they that's so specific that they were there that day. Mm-hmm. I have to assume they were involved. Well, they kind of tie into my last theory, which is that could have just been a wrong place, wrong time situation with the two ex-cons. But if they weren't tied to this via Donald, what motive would they have had to kill the family because there were no reports of credit card Mm -hmm. statements arriving in the mail aside from the charges to the gas station after they went missing and though we've never found the car i don't think it's logical to assume that they went out there and they were somewhere driving it that they would have just stolen the car no i don't think they stole the car i think it i mean it's possible it could have been a robbery situation gone wrong Mm mm-hmm you know what I mean? Like maybe they tried to get the car to pull over, had them at gunpoint, and then the family got spooked. And instead of like complying, they tried to speed off. One of them fires a gun. Yeah. A gun that was provided from the sun. Well, no, I'm getting like mixed up with my own theories here because I keep like, like one track seems to contradict the other or you mm-hmm. have to like fill in another part of the story. Such a strange case. Such a strange case. And Occam's razor would tell us it was probably just an accident. The Martins might have been stopping to just enjoy their view and they accidentally veered off the road and tragically into one of the most treacherous areas of the Columbia River. But one thing is for certain, somewhere in the depths of the Columbia River, the answers to this case lie. And my hope is that the area of Portland, Oregon does not forget about this case. And I think that finding that car would give us so many answers And Ken and Barbara and Barbie deserve to be at peace. And if something sinister did happen, justice should be served in whatever capacity it can be. And 
actually, to your point, I saw a really good quote from the author that wrote a notable book about this case called The Echo of Distant Water, The Disappearance of Portland's Martin Family. And he said, Mm -hmm. quote, any one element would not be enough on its own, but taken in totality, it's another story. That was Graven's main point all along in this case. Trying to stick to the accident theory is actually the tougher path. And I know that these investigations were expensive back in the day, and they certainly are now, but we have so much advanced technology to make discoveries underwater for bodies with sonar, of course, but we've got underwater cameras, and we've got drones and volunteer diving groups that our chances are so much greater these days. So I really hope this case does get another extensive search. I think there actually was a search, a diving search that was done back in the 90s, but nothing came of it. Uh, But I just hope that this could be another boy in the box or a lady of the dune situation where if they're able to find that car, it would bring such a renewed sense of hope for so many other families or victims of deaths that have happened where someone has gone missing in a body of water. But with that baby, that is all I have on the Martin family disappearance. That is a strange case. Isn't that very strange? Yeah. Is there any update on the son and like what his life was like after the fact? Yeah, he actually went on to have four children of his own. He got married. He moved to, I think, Oahu, Hawaii and just lived out a pretty normal life. And then actually one of those documentaries I watched, they tried to go and interview Donald. He was still alive at the time. He's passed since, but they tried to interview him. Uh, he actually agreed to it and then backed out. And then the daughter, I think, eventually sat down with them. And she said, this is just a really dark thing that our our father barely talks to us about. So oh. he's decided he doesn't want to sit down and, and talk with you all about it. Very bizarre. Yeah, I, I do have I do have faith for this case that it, something about it sits in my stomach where I'm like, it could be like the boy in the box where it sits dormant for 50, 60 plus years. And then suddenly something surfaces from beneath the water. Yeah, I'm very curious because you mentioned that they used sonar and they found nothing. But after the fact, there was that anchor situation which produced the body. So there mm-hmm. is something down there. Yeah. It's just a matter yes. of how, whether or not we're going to find it. That's what's baffling to me is that with all the resources we could probably pool today and we mm-hmm. know exactly where that, well, not exactly, but definitely but you have, you have a radius. Proximity. Yeah. Like you can like, you know, a starting point, Yeah, which is important. I mean, like when um the Malaysian airlines flight went down, they spent, I mean, this was much after the fact, but they spent like months and months and months with a robotic search. Mm-hmm. Like there were um, underwater robots that could like basically scale the base of that of the ocean so i something about like i don't know having one of those or something similar to it scale a river seems very doable in my mind even if it's over a very slow period of scouring but i don't know i do you think if they surfaced it if they were able to find the car and surface it there would still be some evidence that could spell a different story like maybe a bullet hole yeah that's kind of what i was thinking because if there's a bullet hole this is a done deal that like yeah it was some kind of a hit or a robbery gone wrong. There's only two ways we can cut it. I just wonder how well the bodies would be preserved at this point. Probably not. Yeah. You think they'd be completely gone? I or mean, like I'm sure the skeletons would remain. Bones, but. Yeah. I Well, when bodies are submerged for a long period of time, from what I've read, they um, you get skin slip where the skin basically saturates with water and becomes so detached it starts to slide right off Mm. of the skeleton and then i would assume that happens to the other flesh underneath the muscle Mm -hmm. um you also from what i've read a case i just recently covered your limbs will start to detach like the body will just start to like come apart like the torso will separate from the head the arms will separate like the whole thing will just start to fall into like pieces Mm. isn't there something too where when you're underwater that long like your whole like the skin starts to bloat basically or it just becomes i think that's in the beginning maybe okay yeah in the very very beginning but i think eventually it's it's all just gonna it's it's live matter it's gonna get eaten away by something either bacteria or wildlife yeah but it, it could be also interesting if the car surfaced or something and there was you know a window broken out or there was Anything, you know, anything. Dents on I mean, car or I'm sure that they would could still, foul play. Yeah, they could still figure out if there was like what the impact of that was like. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? There must be something. Or like, this is really sinister. 
but what if they bring the car up and there's Barbie is like nowhere to be found because she was never found. It was just the other two daughters. But the parents would be found. Mm -hmm. So it was almost like the parents were collateral to push into the water and Barbie was actually taken. Is that the theory? Yeah, I guess. I don't know if there was some sort of theory that the, you know, the Barbie pregnancy thing had legs. One last thing I want to ask, and then I'll definitely put this to bed, but I have so many questions and so many concerns about theories. You said there was another witness statement that didn't have legs or it was almost like laughed out of the initial police intake, but somebody saw potentially a van down the highway that was parked and there were two men inside and one man that was talking to the two men in the van or vice it, versa. I think what it was, it was the eyewitness account that was in uh, detective Graven's like little report that he wrote up. Yeah. I believe what it was saying is that the station wagon was similar to the Martin's station wagon. And they saw this thing flying okay. down the mountain then they saw it parked. Then they saw it again. And when they saw it again, two men were on the outside, presumably like get out of the car or like maybe it was being held up or something was happening. Oh, so they think it was the same station wagon as the family. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. Got it. I thought it was and, a different car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was very interesting. I remember reading that going, how could anybody, two men standing outside of the station wagon? I mean, that paints quite a picture to me, but mm-hmm. I think they also had received so many tips at the beginning that led them on to many wild goose chases that which is kind of wild because this happened out in like the middle of nowhere like how many people could have actually seen something that Mm -hmm. day well i guess i guess for that area it wasn't so crazy that a lot of people drove up to go get their christmas trees in that area or like drove up there on the weekends and did Mm -hmm. like long family drives because it was back in the 50s where you might just go on a long drive on a sunday (laughs) because there wasn't much to do but um could I ask one more question about a theory? Yeah. Is there any credibility to a theory if we're still going the the route of Occam's razor that this wasn't accidental, but it might have been intentional on the part of the father? Mm-hmm. Is it possible in any circumstance? Because I know the son possibly had that gun. He is possibly the one who provided the gun. Is it possible they had some crossover where the father confiscated the gun from his son at one point and the father had the gun? Ooh. I don't know how that would have like worked out, whether he was going up there and contemplating suicide or the mother wrestled the gun away or maybe the eldest daughter did and tried to like stop what was going on. Yeah. And then it just became chaotic and to the point where they just drove. It, like it was going to be a murder suicide pack almost. Yeah. I think it's anything is possible, but I will say I think the gun was found closer to the abandoned Chevy which Got it. people okay. linked it more so to the ex-cons having ownership or possession of that gun rather than Got it. Okay, no, no, no. that makes more but, sense. That, yeah, that kind of eliminates my theory. I just wanted to toss it out there because it, yeah. it wasn't discussed and I was curious if anybody still thinks that the father or possibly the mother yeah. might have had something else going on. Okay, people definitely have theorized that the father could have just, you know, had a moment and decided to drive off the cliff, but there just, just a moment. Just a moment. <laughs> just a moment. there wasn't... But there wasn't much to to back that up, in my opinion. Right. Most, no, most no of the kind accounts of like said that he was super happy. They had, you know, lots going on as a family. They were a tight unit. That mm. it didn't spell that sort of a situation. I don't know. This don't is a know, very maybe. interesting one because I'm very, very stumped. But I know if I'm going to go with Occam's Razor that this was foul play, I'm going to say that it was a hit orchestrated by the son. Yeah. That would be so wild. It, I mean, I, but it's weird because it's like if it does come up to the surface, would we be able to point to that? Would we still if there be was able a bullet to, hole, like, corroborate if that? there was yeah. damage to the rear view of the car? Because in my mind, I was envisioning almost like it was maybe a bit of a chase or like they were trying to get back into their car. And then mm-hmm. the abandoned car with the two goons who were going to like try to put the hit on that or try to hit them. They just rear-ended the car right off the cliff. Yeah. And then they were like, okay, we just took the whole family out. Like, they're yeah. done. Well, Let's you know ditch what? the car and get out of here. There's one other piece of um, that I saw that could point to that, that where they ended up going off of that cliff was close to an aluminum plant that I guess 
Roy mm. Light, one of the ex-cons, lived like right behind. Oh. So that was another weird coincidence. Uh, is that where they ended up going off was not, it was also sort of off road. It wasn't super, it wasn't just like right off the highway. Like it was sort yeah, of like an odd area. Yeah, like why would they be up there anyway? Yeah, yeah. What are they and really it was just a strange for? coincidence that it was right by this aluminum plant that he lived like right behind. What does your gut tell you? My gut tells me that they went to go take in the views or something and that they just lost control of the car and they went off. That's what my really? my gut tells me. Yeah. There's there are so many strange coincidences, but I just the the theory of him putting the hit out feels so convoluted to me just for the times like it just seemed like such an endeavor to do cross country back in the 50s but maybe I just got to like reframe my thinking around that but it just seemed like I believe it was the sun such a task yeah I really believe it was okay well, baby, that's why we got to get that. We got to figure out where that car is and get it to come up. If you think I'm driving up there in Portland, you've got another thing coming, please. I know. I was going to say it's going to be <laughs> oh another God. Denver situation. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I think I've had my fill of driving in a car on a cliff. <laughs> Thank you very much. Creepers. <laughs> Creepers. Whew. Whew. Wow. That was an interesting case. I'm like yeah. enthralled by that. I've got to read up more on this. It's so weird. I'm just going to keep. <laughs> Are you going to take your nails off today? Um, before my like, I'm getting laser today. Before my appointment, I was <laughs> oh, like, yeah. let's let's this... let's spill the real tea. No, well, I'm cool. We're I'm gonna tell them. <laughs> <laughs> this complexion's not happening for nothing. <laughs> but I thought about that. I was like, well, I want to take my nails off because I don't want to like, I don't want them to be on. But like, they are such a pain in the ass to get yeah. off that I'm like, I should just go and then it'll be fine. Just they're just, oh, yeah, they're just they they're so annoying. They're fun to like tap on things. Can you hear? Will mine pick up through this? Do I don't hear it? hear it. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't think that these would show up on the that. directional mics. They only get what's directly in front of them. <laughs> spirit, Sp- directing spirit. <laughs> I'm feeling oh something like in the back of me. Do you sense that? <laughs> I need to think of more of the things like you were saying. The he's showing me a pencil. Do you know what that means? <laughs> It's like all the so objects. I could, listen, I, if shown. I really tap into this crevice of my brain, <laughs> I, know. I know it's there. I know. I know every single episode of this show is there in there somewhere. I know. But it's like she always talks about her symbols. She goes, that is my symbols for doves, which means they are at peace. Do you understand that? Does that make sense to you? <laughs> Do you want to? Please my, acknowledge they is, are coming forward. Please and acknowledge. I'm ta- and I'm saying to myself, oh, my God, holy Toledo. He's like, ask her about the meatloaf recipe. She's got to get <laughs> yes, the meatloaf recipe. That's so good. And I'm that's saying, so good. what meatloaf recipe? And she says, it's up in the cabinet. And I'm like, oh, my God, you got, are you going to get, you got to give me that meatloaf recipe. She really is going for it. And the family's just like, oh, my God, that's exactly how she sounded. She would have, exa- that's exactly what she would have said. There's no, there's no way she could have known that. It's strange no you way. are that because I thought the other, literally the other day, I was like, it's strange I've lived in L.A. for so long and I've never been to a slackic. I'm like, I should go to a medium. You should. I should. But I want to go to a medium to contact the de- I want a Teresa Caputo. Yeah. Like, I don't want I don't want to know about my future. That's that's for future no. Beatle deal with. <laughs> I want to know. About what. <laughs> I don't need to know about my future. I'm yeah, like, yeah, it'll, no. it'll come. It'll happen. <laughs> I'll find out. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's like somebody telling you about a movie before, when you're like, I'm going to go see it in the theater. Like, yeah. I'll see it. It's fine. Don't need to know. But yeah, I want to go to one. I need some I, names. I want to go to one with you. We should. We, well, I mean, I'm still waiting for you for me to pop up and have Allison Dupois on here. Know that. <laughs> Stop. Is that who you were going to be? No, no, oh. that's that's niche. That's that niche. Is niche. That is but I, w- niche. I would try to get her on the show. You know, I bet we yeah. could. I bet we could swing that. We've got great numbers. We could do it. Yeah, yeah, we could do it. We, it just takes one email. Yeah. And I, it takes one DM maybe because I follow her on Instagram. She's very blonde these days, by the way. Is she? Mm-hmm. No more red. 
I mean, she's riding high. Look at everything she's predicted that's come true. I know. <laughs> I love how much you love know that. Know that. <laughs> know that. It's starting to catch on. I was at Universal Horror Nights over the weekend and I said it in front of my group. I was there with Jen and Candace. Hi, yeah. Jen, if you're listening. Um, and Candace said it at one point and I was like, it's catching on. <laughs> it's happening. It. Oh, my God. Oh, Babies. creepers. I was going to say, I think next week, just stay tuned. We got to keep up in the ante. I don't know is next week the last week? Next week is our last week. Oh, my God. And then it's, ha- it's real Halloween, baby. Wait, wait, wait. No, we got one more. We actually we have do? one more. Yeah. Oh, OK. OK. okay. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my. All oh, the costumes. <laughs> How many more lace fronts can I get? How many more Amazon orders can I rush deliver? Well, oh, I wanted to tease this hair up a little bit. It's kind of flat. Baby, that's real good. Let's th- like that's that that's real good. The wig? The the whole costume. I mean Oh, thank you. Yeah. Out of the three, like this one, I'm like, whoa. Really? <laughs> yeah. The I mean, they've all been incredible, but the first two really just like cracked me up. This one, I'm like, that like I'd believe that that was the guy from the movie. Brad Pitt. I was just walking down the street. <laughs> the, the guy character. from the movie. Oh, Brad Pitt. Oh sorry. <laughs> That's Lowe. Lowe. What's what's the guy? The other guy's name? Um, Lestrat or something? Uh, Lestat. Isn't it? Lestat. Lestat. Yeah, Lestat. that's definitely yeah. his name. Did you watch the reboot when they made a TV series? I don't think I did. No. No bueno. No bueno. No bueno. Oh no. shoot. Who was in I it? mean. <laughs> that guy <laughs> yeah some some dude um some guy with a but i was reading something actually because i was like looking it up because i've been looking up a lot of like reference pictures to do the makeup and i was reading how because it was a book first and i was reading how the original author was really really upset when they cast tom cruise back in the 90s she was like i think it was a she but she was so upset that she took out an eight page ad allegedly to, to like rant about this and be like how unfit he was for the role because like she had basically signed over rights to the studio to make the movie and they yeah you know cut her a big fat check or she gets a percentage of the box office whatever it is but when the movie came out she thought he did such an excellent job she publicly recanted her statement oh my god is that the right word recanted yeah yeah recant Mm -hmm. wow he did a great job i'm gonna say he kind of ate that role Yeah. Okay. I have to be perfectly honest. When you first came on, I thought that you were the Tom Cruise character. (laughs) No, no, no. He's he's blonde. He's blonde. That's right. (laughs) I'm Kirsten Dunst. (laughs) Um, Brad Pitt also tried to buy himself out of the movie. I learned. Really? Yeah. When he he was like really not enjoying the process of the makeup and like the filming, he like he did not want to finish the movie and he wanted to buy himself out and have them do a reshoot and replace him, and it would have been a forty million dollar issue. I guess. Wow. So he opted to stay on and finish the movie. Wow. Oh my God. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. I got I now, came with facts today. I was gonna say you you went on IMDB trivia. <laughs> you said, interview Wait, with the on. vampire. My headphones are falling off. Claudia. <laughs> Honestly, putting this when I first put the headphones on, I was like, oh no. <laughs> That's the greatest oh, challenge goodness. that people don't talk about with these costumes. It's like it's not the, the costume wig. itself, it's getting the headphones on That's and right. keeping them on. Because right now I can feel them. They're slipping off. But, oh, Creepers, we want to thank you guys for joining us for a lovely Friday episode of Creep Time, the podcast. Love you, Creepers. And as always, goodbye. And good luck. We're going to catch you guys on the next one. Don't forget to get your tickets to the tour at CreepTime.com. And we'll see you next week. Bye, guys.